So now we're going to go through another example where we're going to build a counter. That is a circuit that just counts 0, 1, 2, 3. And this is going to be important because we're going to introduce something called state. That is where we store a value in a circuit. We don't just calculate a value based on the inputs. So let's take a look at this. Well, first of all, what does a counter do? Well, I already told you it just counts up 0, 1, 2, 3. So that's not a problem. How would we write that in logic? Well, we can write it here. The next value equals the current value plus 1. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So we've got two wires in here, and we've got an adder and a 1. So what is our output from our counter? Well, our output is just the current value. So we're going to go ahead and build this. What do we need? We talked about these big logic blocks we had before. We need a next value, a current value, a plus, or an adder, and a 1. So let's go ahead and build it. Here's our adder. It's going to take in an A and a B and generate a sum. Here's our next value. That's the output coming out of here. We've got a 1 going into the adder. And then we want to say our next value is our current value plus 1, so we'll feed it around here. And then our current value is the output. So this is a little confusing. Our next value and our current value are both the same wire. Yet we have this equation over here that says our next value is the current value plus 1. So what's going on here? Well, the problem we have here is there's feedback. So this adder is going to take its input, add 1, and then send that output directly back into the input. It's going to go around and around. This is not a counter that's going to count nicely 0, 1, 2, 3. It's just going to give us random garbage because it's going to be sending stuff through here so quickly. This feedback is not a good idea. So there's the feedback, and this is not, not going to work. So to break the feedback, we need to do two things. We need some way to store the current value until we're ready to update it. So remember the current value we're using up here, we're saying the next value is the current value plus 1. So we need to store the current value until we're ready to update to the next value. And then we need something to tell us when we should do that update. So we need a way to store something, and this storage here is exactly the state I was talking about before. And then we need something to tell us when to update. And this when is going to be a clock, and that clock signal is going to tell us when to update. So to talk about this, let's cover the two main categories of logic. So there's combinational logic and sequential logic. Combinational logic, the output just depends on the input. This is what you've seen before. All the circuits we made, you could tell me exactly what the output was just by knowing what the inputs were. Sequential logic is different. The output depends on the input and the state. That is, the circuit is going to store inside of it some values and the output depends on those stored values plus the input. So let's take a look at some examples. So for combinational logic we had an adder. You know that the output of an adder is always the addition of whatever its inputs are, a plus b. Or an AND gate. The output of an AND gate is always the AND of its inputs. It doesn't matter what the circuit was doing before, its outputs are always going to be the AND of its current inputs. Now for sequential logic we have this example of a counter. Here the output depends on the count. It depends on the previous value. So somewhere inside the counter we need to store the previous value and then we're going to add 1 to it to generate the next value. So this storing the value inside the circuit is what makes this a sequential circuit. So the state is a stored value and we use this clock input to tell us when to update. So when the clock input comes around it's going to tell us go ahead and update the stored count value to the next value. Now how do we draw this? Well this is what a state element looks like. This little triangle here indicates that you're going to hook up a clock to it. In this case we have a state element where we have an input and output and when this clock signal comes in it's going to transfer the input from the in over to the output. So when the clock signal comes this in is going to now become the new output and it's going to remember that value. So you can see how this is going to break up the feedback loop that we had before. So in general the way things work is we have both combinational logic and sequential logic. So we're going to have our combinational logic here and this is going to take our inputs and it's going to generate our next state. We're going to put the next state into our state element here and that's going to output our current state and then we're going to feed this back around here. So our next state value here is going to be generated by some logic which takes in our inputs and our current state. So let's take a look at how this would work for the counter. So for a counter, we're going to store the current value, and we're going to calculate the next value by adding 1. 
So here's our combinational logic. In a counter, it's just an adder. So the logic we use is to add. The input is going to be 1 for our counter. And what are we going to add? We're going to add 1 plus the current value. Then this adder is going to generate our next value. We put the next value into our state here, and it's going to st which is storing our current value, and it's going to output our current value. So now we have our current value going into our adder, plus 1, and generating the next value, but we only update the current value when the clock signal comes. So when the clock signal comes, we're going to say, now we've got our new next value, and we're going to go ahead and make that our current value. And this is what breaks up the feedback loop. It's this clock signal that comes in here. So now that we know something about state, let's see how we can go ahead and build a counter with something called a latch. And a latch is a state element that stores some data. So what do we need? Well, we know we need next value, current value, a plus and a one, but now we also know we need a latch to store the current value. So here's our latch, just looks like the state element we had before, and how are we going to wire this up? Well, our sum here is going to be our next value, that's going to go into the latch. The output of the latch is the current value, and the addition over here is going to use one as an input, and it's going to use the previous current value. It's going to add them together. And so now we've broken up the feedback path. Remember the feedback path before went all the way around. Now it goes around and it stops at the latch. So this next value isn't going to go through to the current value until the clock comes along. And when the clock comes along, then we're going to see this value go to the output. So the latch stores the current value and it updates the current value to the next value on the clock signal. As I've mentioned before, this is a state element. It's storing a value. So the value is stored inside here, and the output is depending on the value. All right, so now let's walk through a little bit of this counterexample. So say our output, our state here, is 0. What's going to happen? Well, that means our current value is 0, so our counter is at 0. That value is going to go around to the adder. Now the adder has two inputs, a 0 and 1. And we know that if an adder has two inputs, a 0 and 1, its output is going to be a 1. So it goes through the adder, and we get a 1 going out, and we have a 1 as our next value. Note that we've calculated our next value, but we haven't changed our current value, because we need to wait. We need to wait for the clock to come by before we change that. So when the clock comes in, we're going to take this input here, and we're going to move it to the output. So here comes the clock, take the input, and we move it to the output, and now our output becomes 1, and our current value is 1. So when the clock came along, it caused this change. Now, our output, our current value is 1, and this is going to go through the rest of our circuit. So our next value is now going to be the current value plus 1 or 2, and you can see that the same thing happens. We now have 1 going into our adder. 1 plus 1 is going to give us 2 coming out of our adder, and now we're ready to do the next addition for the next time the clock comes around. So as we mentioned before, the latch doesn't update until the clock comes. So let's go ahead and try this in Logisim. So here we are in Logisim. And we can get out some parts we're going to need. Well, we're going to need an adder. Here's our adder. And we're going to need something to go and store our state. So in this case, we're going to use a register, which is a whole bunch of latches together. And we're going to hook them up. So here's the output of our adder. Hook it to the input of our register. Take the output of our register. Come around here. Hook it up to one of the inputs of our adder. And then we need a constant. So we need that 1 that we're going to do there. So I'll go grab a constant over here. Take my constant, hook it up to my adder. Oops, incompatible widths, okay. Go into my constant here, change it to be eight bits. Make sure I also change it so that it's still one. Now we've got our circuit all set up. Now I'm gonna put a probe on this circuit. So the probe here is gonna let me read out the value of the circuit. You can see a probe is in binary. I don't want it in binary, so I can go over here and change this to be an unsigned decimal. All right, so there's my circuit. It's got a zero. Looks just like the circuit we drew. I'm going to go up to simulate, simulate enabled, reset simulate, and now I'm going to tell it tick once, or command T, which tells it go ahead and run the clock. Keep doing this, nothing's happening. Well, okay, this isn't surprising, nothing's happening. I haven't hooked up the clock yet. Okay, let's go grab a clock, put the clock in here, we'll hook our clock up, and now you can see that our clock is zero. And so I'm going to go ahead and tick the clock. Now the clock became one. And so when the clock came, you can see our output changed. Now our output is 1. And clock, check the clock again. Now the clock changed again, and our output became 2. Now I can keep going through this, and you can see our counter is working just the way we expect it to. 
So this latch, this state element here is changing every time the clock goes from low to high. We're going to talk a little bit more about how that happens in the next part of the lecture. All right, so here's a question about latches. What does the latch in the circuit do for us? Well, this latch both stores the current value and breaks the feedback loop. So you can see here the feedback loop is broken. We've calculated our next value of 1, but we're still outputting the 0. When the clock comes along, we're going to take that 1 and move it over to the output of the latch, and then our current value will be 1. Now, very closely related to this is how fast can we run the circuit. So if I have this circuit here, how quickly can this count? Can I count one time a second, or a million times per second, or a billion times per second? So if we change the question here, since it's the clock that determines how quickly we count, how quickly can we change the clock? Can I run my counter at 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz? So let's see what's limiting us here. So there are a bunch of things that are going to limit us here. How long does it take us to do the addition? If it takes a long time for this adder to generate the results, obviously we're going to be slower. So let's say the adder takes 2 nanoseconds to compute the result. There's also the question, how long does it take to get the data back and forth? So we've got times for these different wires. Let's say they each take 1 nanosecond. And then there's also how slow is the latch? How long does it need to store the data? Let's just say that's also 1 nanosecond. Now we can figure out how fast we can run. Because we need to move our data all the way around here, and we can't change the clock faster than it takes our data to move around. So in this case, it takes us one nanosecond plus two, sorry, one nanosecond plus two nanoseconds plus one plus one, or five nanoseconds to go all the way around this loop. And if we can change the clock every five nanoseconds, that means our circuit can run at 200 megahertz. And this is exactly the same for any processor you look at today. If you buy a two gigahertz processor, that means somewhere inside the processor, the fastest the logic can go is at 2 gigahertz. So let's look at the key ideas we had here from the counter. So we have combinational logic. That's this part over here. It takes in the current value and the 1 and generates the next value. This is combinational logic, so its output only depends on the inputs. Then we had our latch, which is our sequential part of this. It stores the current value, and it updates the current value to the new value only when the clock signal comes by. So this allows us to break the feedback loop, and it allows us to store the current value. We also talked about how fast you can run this circuit. It depends on how long it takes you to go around these wires and through the logic. So we talked about this in a counter, but this is the same for the processor we saw earlier. So here's the simple processor we looked at earlier. So we have a latch. That's our program counter. It stores the address of the current instruction. We have some logic to determine the next instruction. That's the control here. What is it doing? Well, it's doing PC plus 4. In fact, it looks just like the circuit we had here, but we're adding 4 instead of adding 1. And then when the clock comes around, we store the next value into the program counter. So all of the stuff we talked about here is the same sort of thing that we use in the processor, and the speed of the processor is determined by the time it takes to go through the logic in the same way that we saw here.